All right, everyone, welcome to our first Friday, our second first Friday. Uh, the VAPA music program is so proud to be able to present the award-winning flutist, composer, band leader, and educator, Nicole Mitchell. Ms. Mitchell has received global accolades for her genre-expanding creative music. She is director, currently she is the director of jazz studies at the University of Pittsburgh, Pittsburgh's Department of Music. And, and uh, I just wanna briefly talk a little bit about uh, her, 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 uh, her life, or not your life, but your work. Um, you, you are, uh, Nicole, you are the first woman president of Chicago's Association for the Advancement of Creative Musicians. The AACM is, a, is an association that we, that comes up often in our classes in a variety of different classes um, when, we, when we talk about jazz and American music and just music and creative experimental music in general. And uh, George Lewis, who was here last year as a special guest artist, uh, is also part of, of this collaborative. Um, and since 2010, uh, Nicole, you have been repeatedly awarded top flutist of the year by Downbeat Magazine Critics Poll, as well as the Jazz Journalists Association. Uh, you have been the founder of Black Earth, you are the founder of Black Earth Ensemble, Black Earth Strings, Sonic Projections, and Ice Crystal, and you compose for a variety of contemporary ensembles um, of all different sizes and instrumentation. And I found this quote on your website, which I love. Nicole Mitchell, end, uh, I'm sorry. Nicole Mitchell celebrates endless possibility by creating visionary worlds through music that bridge the familiar with the unknown. As a composer, Nicole Mitchell has been, uh, has been commissioned by the French Ministry of Culture, the Chicago Museum of Contemporary Art, the Art Institute of Chicago, the French American Jazz Exchange, the Stone, Chamber Music America, the, I mean, just the list goes on and on. Um, you've also performed as a flutist with extraordinary music luminaries um, like Roscoe Mitchell, Joelle Leandra, Anthony Braxton, George Lewis, Jerry Allen, Mark Dresser, Steve Coleman, Anthony Davis, Myra Milford, Mohal Richard Abrams, the, again, another list that goes on and on. <laughs> and you've been a recipient of many awards, uh, for example, the Herb Albert Award and the Chicago Three Arts Award and the Dor Doris Duke Award. Um, and then just some quotes that I love. Um, I love this quote by the LA Times, Chris Barton says, a furiously inventive flutist and composer and improviser, Mitchell's albums work through the anxieties of 2017 and probably since then uh, <laughs> with a swirling spiritually charged trip. And also Nicole Mitchell is the vanguard of the flute virtuoso continuum. Yay! <laughs> <laughs> As a fellow flutist, um, of course I admire that quote. <laughs> So let's give uh, Nicole a warm welcome. Let's all applaud and give you a welcome. Yay. Thank you so much for being here, Nicole. Thank you. Um, I wish I could see people. <laughs> it's so strange. I, I hear the, I heard the clapping. I'm like, wow, there's like a room of people somewhere. <laughs> there is, there is a room full. It's a very large room and we're all spread out. Uh, but we'll make as much noise as possible, right, everyone? Uh, when appropriate, <laughs> in appropriate time. <laughs> um, so I want to just ask you a few questions um, and and ask you to sure. share. Um, uh, you know, we're we do these first Fridays, and we're we're here with students and and faculty as well are here. And um, I'm really interested in your trajectory in, as an artist, as a person. Um, and I heard that you started out as a computer science, uh, that you studied computer science and then eventually you kind of went into music. How did that evolve for you? Um, how did, and how does that, maybe your, any previous studies influence your work, your current work now? Not too many people have asked me that question. So uh, yes, when I went into college, I had decided I was gonna study computer science and to be a systems analyst and 
actually that changed pretty quickly because I found myself practicing 12 hours a day in the practice room. And I was like, yeah, it would be great to be a woman, a black woman in computer science that's needed, but I'm going to follow my heart and do this music. And so what I actually just realized recently is the idea of being a systems analyst is kind of still part of what I do, maybe not in computer science, but I am very fascinated and disturbed by <laughs> our system <laughs> and the system, the Western systems, the Western ways of being that have us really hitting a dead end. And so I am I do find myself trying to find answers and then using the music as an experimental laboratory to create new paradigms and experiment with new social structures and community and and model equity and you know model diversity and 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 coexistence in ways where difference is celebrated, not ignored or erased, but that difference is something that's seen as an asset and that is seen and that is that is embraced, you know, versus the melting pot idea, which is pretty much done. <laughs> so I do find myself using problem solving skills, not just in playing a passage as a musician or something like that, but in like trying to use my compositions as a way to do intercultural collaboration and and to you know attack some of these or not attack but find new approaches uh, not that i feel there is a be all end all in music but it's it's fascinating to me and definitely uh, something you brought up about endless possibility we do create new worlds with music. Music is not physical. It's not something you can see. So the realm that it exists in is a space for liberation that can inform and transform our present reality. That's what I believe. Oh, that's so beautiful. I love that, that we have, um, you found, I love that you found a kind of empowerment, right? Um, and another thing that I've, I've noticed is that you, you've talked in previous inter interviews about enduring um, hostility or negativity in your life. And so is this how you, um, being a creative musician, how has that helped you find this power? And has you, has it, have you found it through other people? Have you found it through performance? Have you found it through composition? Or how, is, how do you find this empowering um, uh, feeling or confidence or you know way of being yeah as a, as a young person you know you talk about third grade fourth grade fifth grade you know these are cute little kids at this age to to have to had deal with people spitting on my face and calling me the n-word and getting in fights with me and me getting kicked out of school you know trying to defend myself and when I think about it as an adult, of course, it makes me really sad that I had to go through that and a lot of other kids that look like me around the country post-integration have continued to have to go through that, including my grandchildren now. And the only way that I found a solution in those situations as a child was to protect not to just ignore the way people were treating me and act like it wasn't happening. It wasn't to fight back, but it was to treat those people as if they were my friend, even though they were treating me like crap. And somehow they would forget they were supposed to hate me. And I feel the music did save my life because it was the one thing that I could focus on that it was a safe space for me, so I feel that the idea of music as refuge is is something that can be empowering, like I said about it being another, like a literal space for liberation, even though it's not in 3D. And it's also an opportunity to flip hierarchies, to uh, circumvent oppression, to <laughs> disrupt, you know, what we deal with in, the, in our daily reality and to, you know, even though the business itself 
presents all the same problems we have in society in the music. And as we create the music, we can cre create these alternative ways of being with each other. And, and so that has been really empowering. I actually started in an all women's group. Uh, and I did that for seven years before I became a band leader uh, myself because I didn't have the confidence. So it, that helped me to build the confidence, bringing my music to that group. Um, and so now, of course, you know, I had to learn how to talk about the music, which I was a very shy person. I didn't, I didn't really want to tell people what to do. I didn't want to be a band leader, but I was never going to hear my music otherwise. So these things, music can be a path to self-development and, and really challenging yourself to do things you're not comfortable with and facing uncomfortability towards your own growth, you know, so yeah. <laughs> Oh, I don't hear you. Oh, hello. Yeah. yeah. What about the people you've you've worked with? Um, some of the most influential artists. Your voice keeps going down. I don't oh, know why. hello. Let me get get closer to the mic here. Okay. Um, I'd love to know a little bit more about the people you've you've worked with, who've helped you develop, who've encouraged you. Um, and how are you, so I'd love to know about just some of the artists you've worked with and, and who've influ influenced you, as well as how you turn that around as an educator and a band leader and a, and a model, a role model. Like what yeah. are some things that you learned that now you're giving? Yeah, I'll start with someone that most people don't know. Her name is Maya and she's still around. She lives in Los Angeles. She's a multi-instrumentalist and a multi-dimensional artist who does dance, poetry, acting but she plays vibraphone cello and does vocals and plays the flute and we we started Samana together with Shantanurala and she was like a big sister to me she's like 15 year old 15 years older than me and so I really looked to her almost like a mother figure when I was younger and her band leading style was very much coming from the old school because she studied with Phil Coran, who's one of the founders of the ACM. And I took, like, I learned a lot in terms of how she composed and how she used narrative for her compositions, which I also do and which I also gravitated toward. I, um, so I learned a lot on, on that level from her and I, I worked at Third World Press for 13 years. It's like the oldest African-American book publishing company in the country. And that really gave me a grounding, it, like reading all those books that I was working on uh, that were coming out of that, that publishing company and, and being under the mentorship of Haki Madabudi, who, who was formerly known as Don Lee, the poet. That definitely gave me a really strong grounding that I think informs everything that I do, it, uh, grounding in self-knowledge and identity and culture, in Black culture, um, which I think is important for people to investigate them, their history, their lineage, their culture, to know who you are, to know like what some of your family has gone through before you came around and before you got the opportunities that you have today. And, and that will definitely give you a sense of where you're trying to go. And so the ACM, Maya was the first person I worked with in the ACM. And then of course, it's like so many amazing mentors. I'll just, I don't have all day. So I'll just bring up Anthony Braxton. Um, I started playing with him and uh, his 12 plus one Ted. I always wondered if I was the plus one. <laughs> And, and it was amazing to me that he was using the music to experiment with his ideas of democracy, his ghost trance music, really more than any music I've ever seen, trans, tr transitions or transforms this idea of the, the relationship between musicians performing, because everyone in the group 
has the agency at any moment to pick up a different piece of music and start it with someone else and take the music in a completely different direction. It's not just about a band leader telling everybody what to do and cueing everybody, but every single person in the group has an agency to impact the direction of the music and you have layers of conversations happening simultaneously in the music. And so I learned a lot from witnessing and being a part of that. I also learned a lot as a performer in the Chicago Sinfonietta playing piccolo uh, in this orchestra that was, you know, playing a mixture of like traditional Western classical music and pieces by, you know, uh, current new composers and being in the center of the orchestra and hearing all of that around me definitely influenced my compositional development in addition to so many things. So, you know, George Lewis has been an amazing mentor who impacted like a lot of ways that I hear by exposing me to a lot of great artists that I might not have looked for or heard of in, and, uh, without a Leo Smith and his own notational systems and Roscoe Mitchell and his totally unique language that he developed for the saxophone. It just goes on and on and on. Yeah. Yeah. So amazing. Oh, there's so much uh, to talk about in that. Um, I don't even know what to, how to even keep going, but I'll just keep going forward here. Um, and I'm hoping that the audience will come up with questions of their own. We have, uh, a mic to out here so people can can ask questions briefly. Um, so uh, I, I've heard you talk about improvisation um, and this idea of forgetting yourself or somehow this idea of the ego. And we have a lot of improvisers here. We have a lot of young improvisers here in our in our program um, or people who are, are uh, wanting to be improvisers. And um, I'm wondering how you encourage students or anyone really um, to begin to explore improvisation in this, this non-judgmental way, you know, a, a way that, that allows us to be in this moment now um, and to, to develop our listening. Our listening. Um, how, how, what do you say <laughs> to someone who, who wants to do this but is, is very frightened? Well, I started out that way because as a flute player, being in jazz wasn't just handed to me on a plate. Like I had to be exposed to it much later, which I was sad about, but I didn't find out about it till I was started college. And then I had to start all over and not know anything about how to, I couldn't, you know, my ear wasn't that great. And it was really hard to have gotten to a certain level in your playing ability. And then like, now I got to start all over again. Like I'm just a baby, you know? Um, so embracing the uncomfortable, I'll probably say more than once. I think that's really key for us as humans to grow and to embrace that vulnerability that you don't know what you're doing and just be like, okay, it's all right to not know what I'm doing. Let me just feel this out. You know, I definitely encourage you to play with the radio. You could do that by yourself and just see if you can find the key that you're hearing and find things that sound good. What I did, I started immediately playing on the street, which now, right now is kind of awkward with COVID, but I played on the street for several years uh, in San Diego and in Chicago. And that's where I met a lot of the musicians that I ended up having lifelong relationships with, them hearing me play on the street. And I would just make up animations for the people that walked by. And, and it was literally 100% improvised where it wasn't like, oh, let me play this key or this chord or these chord changes or this melody. He was literally just practicing making things up, making up themes and feelings and energies and vibes and all of that like in the moment. And so I think I definitely encourage people to do that. And then you can get with one person and just 
play together. I think one-on-one -on -one is a beautiful way to develop as an improviser. You can trade off, you can support each other, you can do free stuff together. And it's a great way to have a conversation musically without having um, too many barriers. I think people get scared when there's too many rules and too many ways to be wrong. So if you're starting out, there's lots of different ways you can approach. Take your instrument apart. What kind of sounds can you make that you've never made before with your instrument? You know, play with, play, you know, take it apart and put it back together wrong. Like do the stuff that you were told that you're not allowed to do because you can do that as an improviser. So it, it's a, a different way of thinking about music because it's not about perfection, it's about expression. Yeah, you can't see it, but I'm smiling. <laughs> <laughs> That's so wonderful. Um, and so now you're you're you you started out as a as a classical flutist and went into jazz and then composition and now you're a band leader and you and I and I heard you say you had to become a band leader because otherwise your your pieces wouldn't wouldn't have been uh, performed. Um, what what are some lessons that you've learned as a band leader that are maybe different? Than, than as a performer or a composer? Um, just something that you might want to share with our students and faculty. I think, well, the most important thing is that the music has a life of its own. And so you can't micromanage it. I get really annoyed if I'm in a group that I'm playing someone's music and they totally micromanage everything because you're not getting the best out of the musicians, especially if you have improvisation. Like if you micromanage everything, you don't even know the potential that you could have playing your piece because you're too busy trying to control it. And that's what actually was horrifying to me that here I have this band and they go off and do something I didn't expect to happen. And oh my God, like I just want to throw up. Like I, my first few concerts as a band leader, I would like on the break, I would go throw up in the bathroom, like because <laughs> it was horrifying to me, but I'm used to it now. <laughs> but but uh, yeah, I think that's really important is that the music lives it's not it's an organic thing it's not this like inanimate object like a piece of wood or something which a piece of wood is alive too actually but you know but i mean it's like it's it's very uh vibrant and you guide it but you don't control it yeah yeah, that's beautiful. And that's very almost metaphorical about you can apply that to so many areas of our lives. You know, you know, how do we how do we allow for things to be and how do we allow our relationships or or just the moment to happen right now and just uh, and, and listen and just be prepared for the unexpected right to welcome that. Yeah. Another thing that you've you've talked about um, as a composer, you've talked about um, getting to the edge of beauty, mm -hmm. which I find um, really poignant, especially right now where, where there's a lot of non-beautiful things going on. And so how do we, how do we, um, how do we embrace this idea of, of, of getting to the edge? You know, we, we think of music as, as always being this thing that's, that's uh, you know, joyful or emotional, but how do we get to a point where we're at the edge of something, the edge of beauty or the edge of, of anything, you know? Pauline Oliveros has this really great question, you know, can you imagine uh, beyond the edge of your own imagination? And so this idea of edges or borders and how do we, how do we move across them through, through our music and, and um, our musical relationships? Do you have anything you wanna share about that? Definitely. I mean, first of all, I'll go back to being in grammar school and how I was not considered in any way beautiful. I don't know. I can't count how many times I was told I was ugly growing up all the way through high school. And it was really just because I wasn't white. <laughs> there was no other reason. But I didn't know that at the time. So I really believed that I was ugly. And uh, 
the fact that society, I'm saying this to say that society tells us what we're supposed to believe is beautiful and it really is not true. I mean, the fact is, like I'm talking about diversity again, that beauty can come in a lot of different forms. So to challenge your own notions of beauty, I think is the first step by dealing with your sound. Like if as a musician, you've decided already what, and it might be what you've been taught, but you've decided what you think is beautiful in terms of how you sound and how you play. And you reach for that in a lot of the music you play what if you just took some exercises where you tried to reach beyond that and do some things that that make you like i said make you feel uncomfortable or that sound strange to you or you know maybe maybe express another part of yourself that you don't necessarily want to show other people you know i think these are ways of knowing ourselves more fully and also ways of connecting with other people you know because the idea of beauty like it's it's something we're taught and different cultures might have different ideas about what those things are you know but western culture i think has impacted everyone around the globe with that those standards so it's really amazing to go through that journey for yourself with your sound and for me it meant doing things with my voice that were kind of scary sounding and then incorporating my voice into the flute. And, you know, like as a woman, if there's this kind of like in your subconscious fear about like people thinking you're a witch or something, like, I don't think anybody ever thinks about it, but when you start making weird sounds like, uh, like, ooh, you don't want to sound like that. That's some scary stuff. Like, so it's all in there. It's all part of human expression, but it's not all embraced. So to go to those spaces that are not embraced and explore and try to not place judgment because that helps you also in life to not place judgment so much about things that you're not, comfortable or familiar with and to be able to say okay I mean Braxton has a great story how when he first heard a record of Roscoe Mitchell he's like oh my god turn it off I don't want to hear that it sounds horrible and then he spent the whole night thinking about that record and he went back and was like can I hear that again and then you see where he went with it you know but if we don't allow ourselves those opportunities then it's just limiting yeah so true and I'd love to make sure we have some time to hear some of your your music or some of your projects. Is there anything you want to share with us um, in terms of your, uh, you know, collaborations either in the past or, or what you're working on now? Is there anything you want to share with us? Sure. And maybe you could help me with the sound because when I share screen, I want the sound to be good, but I don't know. Do I need to do something in the preferences for Zoom or? Yeah, so when you, when you go to share the screen on the lower left corner, you'll uh -huh. hit, hit share computer sound. Oh, okay. And then there might be an optimized video. Just hit that there as well. Just click on that as well. And that okay. should work. Um, yeah, that should, should work, hopefully. Okay. Okay, uh, let me see. Let me open this movie up and then. Okay, now I'm going to share screen. Okay, share computer sound. Do I do op optimize yeah. screen share for video clip? Yeah, I would do that too. Yes. Okay. Okay. There we go. Okay. I'm going to play a little bit of this. This is a video. This is a COVID project. All the people that are performing on this sent me a two minute improvisation, what they did with their phone. And then I made it into this video, into oh, wow. songs. So the songs weren't songs. It wasn't like 
we laid out this song, this song, this song, and you cover this and you overdub that. It was like, they just sent me total random improvisations. And then I tried to make music out of it. Oh my God, it's amazing. Okay, so. Yeah. Facing the East. I don't know how to get rid of this thing, but that's
has a, such a dreamy quality to it. So you're like the dream weaver. You're like weaving together all these. Yeah, it was just amazing how certain things fit together that the other person, the person making it had no idea that it was going to do that. Um, especially when you see somebody playing on the beach and they're playing with somebody playing in their room, but they're together like yeah. musically. It was, it was really, I had a lot of fun doing that. And I definitely want to do more projects like that. It's challenging. It's like putting together a puzzle. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. You know? And then of course my, my movie experience, like my filmmaking experience is very minimal. So it didn't always match up perfectly, but you know, in terms of like people's mouth working with the sound or, but so I got to graduate from iMovie, so. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, it's a beautifully, beautifully done, really. Congratulations on that. Thanks. Um, what, other, what other projects, before we get to questions from the audience, um, is, there, is there any other projects or, or anything you're working on now or that you wanted to share that you, you have worked on that you wanted to share with us? Yeah, I have, I'll just give a little excerpt of this one. This is one that um, International Contemporary Ensemble ICE uh, they've been playing around with it. it's a remote version of one of my pieces so it's made to be played online and you know with the challenges of of uh, zoom and all of that kind of thing and and so they actually uh, recorded one of the rehearsals so I'm going to just play a little tiny bit of it it's actually being performed tonight um, which I didn't notice until I looked online today uh, so I'm going to share just a little bit of that right quick. Let me see. I'm going to, I'm not going to start right at the beginning and I'm just going to play a little bit of it. <laughs> out of the coral of the root. I wouldn't have burst into the sun. So that was a combination of some pre-recorded uh, movements and like live movements online that are duo or solo. The piece itself is 20 different colors and there are like short pieces that can be played by mixed, you know, it's like kind of unlimited wood instrumentation or the number of instruments that can play the piece. And some of the pieces are graphic scores and some are notated and, and, or hybrid. So there's a lot of flexibility with the piece that I made it in 2017 so that ICE could play with educational, in educational situations with different levels of musicians in terms of their experience. And, but because it's made for small configurations that are changing, it was easy to adjust it down to solos and duos for COVID 
and and then they already had some recordings of the you know like larger group stuff but that that scene of seeing all the musicians there that like usually you would have that would be the normal setup you'd have like maybe seven ten musicians but then they're only ever playing in like small groups and they're overlapping the pieces so wow. yeah wow. it's called inescapable spiral beautiful wonderful and that's playing tonight um it's in the chat window um and uh yeah so we can we can uh, announce that and make sure people know about that um so wonderful um so i'd love to open the floor to anyone even the people who are in the zoom meeting uh they can write in the chat window um questions and here is the the ice uh, events for tonight that you can you can get into um, and learn about uh, present, seeing this show tonight. Um, questions? Uh, don't be shy. I don't know where the mic is. Um, it's over there. Um, so questions for Nicole from from the people attending, perhaps. So we've got lots of people attending on Zoom. Um, looks like we're we've got. Is that Glenn coming? Yay! Glenn's gonna ask a question. <laughs> I hope. <laughs> Hello. Yes. Hey, Nicole, can you hear me? Can you hear me? I hear you. I can't see you, but right. I can hear you. I'm 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 invisible. Um, I have a question. I, I you're um a relatively is this your second year at the University of Pittsburgh or? Yeah, I'm just third? starting my second year. Your second year. Uh, so. Uh, Nicole Mitchell, she's the director of jazz studies at the University of Pittsburgh. Is that correct? Yes. And formerly, before that, you were at um, the University of California, Irvine. Yes. You you actually may know uh, one of our alumnus, uh, Lizzie Erickson. Oh yeah. Um, yeah I worked with Lizzie. Oh yeah. great. Yeah, she she was highly complimentary of of you. And yeah. Lizzie is living in uh, L.A. and she's a gainfully employed uh, music producer and audio engineer. Yeah. <laughs> so you can be gamefully in place. So my question, <laughs> it has nothing to do with that, but my question is about, I find it so interesting that you're a, a director of a jazz studies department or program. And, you know. Why? I mean, the, no, I'm just kidding. Because, <laughs> because you're such an incredibly expansive musician. And, you know, jazz programs can be riddled with or, you know, kind of like like a lot of things in music and genres can have these boundaries or or schools that go in different directions or define themselves. And how Mike, I'm curious, how is the jazz program you're running? How is that being defined musically? And I, I, it's kind of hard to ask the word this in the correct way. Are there push and pulls from various elements of the program? Um, and actually, I have a second question for you uh, after this. Um, okay, yeah, let me just tackle that first. <laughs> but definitely try to remember your second question. So yes, the fact that I'm a flute player, first of all, jazz has never like heralded flute very much. The fact that I am a woman. The fact that the music that I am most often heard playing is what we call creative music and is, is maybe in the fringes of what we call jazz. All those three reasons make it very fascinating that, that, uh, that I'm the, the chair of this program and ex very exciting for me, I feel very, very blessed and I feel very supported. I'm so excited about the community in Pittsburgh. Pittsburgh has a really strong jazz community and it's a very traditional community in terms of the music that it's the legacy of the music in jazz. Billy Strayhorn came from there, Mary Lou Williams left a really great legacy there. You know, Earl Gardner, we have the Earl Gardner archives, thanks to Jerry Allen, who was my predecessor, which is some huge feet to, you know, yeah. some huge shoes to step into. And Nathan Davis, who spent 40 years of his life completely dedicated to developing the program. So 
I've never been, I'm kind of unique as an AACM member that I've never uh, shrugged my shoulders about being identified as a jazz musician where some of my colleagues and mentors would absolutely never want to be called a jazz musician. Mm -hmm. But for myself, I've always embraced that identity because I, I love to, to be um, next, you know, in line after the great works of, you know, Ella Fitzgerald or some of the people I've talked about, Jerry Allen, Mary Lou Williams. Um, there's so many great musicians that are part of this legacy. And it's, I see it as an expansive legacy. And I see jazz as not only being about music, but it's about community. It's, it's about change. It's, it's always been a force for transformation and consciousness. And so I actually haven't had any challenges really. Um, the department, the music department and the jazz program has been very supportive. Um, I haven't made any huge changes curriculum yet, but we are looking at doing some curriculum changes right now. Jazz, the way I define jazz, or I have defined it if I was gonna put it in one sentence, would be a globalized African-American freedom vehicle, which means that it's something that generously offers anyone the opportunity to tell their story through the music and that's extremely diverse, you know what I'm saying? So it's a really important aspect of American culture. And I think people are starting to realize that the depth of impact, the fact that your class, I'm sure, is a very diverse class with people from different backgrounds, that was really made possible through the civil rights movement, but jazz music opened the door for intercultural collaboration in this country back during prohibition, when it was illegal for people of different races to come together. In these illegal spaces, there was jazz and there was multiculturalism. And so we owe jazz a lot in terms of our ability to have the types of freedoms that we have now. And obviously it's been very clear this summer and this year that we still have a really long way to go. There's still a lot of issues um, with racism, especially anti-black racism, and that even jazz has not lived up to its full legacy in academia in, in, in um, helping people to um, develop more sensitivity, cultural sensitivity. We have too many jazz students that don't know anything about African-American culture or black culture. And that doesn't make sense. You know what I'm saying? So I'm really excited. Um, I have some projects where I'm working on creating platforms for engagement between the Pittsburgh community and the students that are gonna be really exciting and, and are gonna be pretty unique, like that you won't be able to find in other places. So, so far, so good. That's, that's awesome. That's like the best answer ever. I, I, yeah, <laughs> fantastic. That is so inspiring. Um, and, uh, so my, my second question is, is kind of more about um, your students and, and our students and, and their generation coming of age now. Um, and, you know, I, I find it so interesting that, that, you know, as time goes on, in some ways, like compared to some of our students five or ten years ago, they have, I, I just noticed very different perspectives on life, different life experiences, in some ways more mature experiences, especially mm -hmm. going through what, what they're going through now. So I, I think like, what do you, what do you see? Uh, do you see like, or what, what musical directions, is there anything that's, that you're noticing about their approaches to music 
uh, and development of their careers, first of all, that may be new and different? Um, how are they approaching things maybe in the entrepreneurially or community oriented? And I guess, you know, what, what kind of a sort of that, of that kind of creative advice would you have for our students? Well, my godmother says that um, we are living in some troubled times, but we're also living in some incredibly exciting times. I think that we have a lot of opportunities. Uh, I know a lot of young people are utilizing social media in ways that we can't even in our generation understand. <laughs> You know, my daughter literally makes her living online and she's completely independent and doesn't, she can live anywhere she wants in the world because she can do her job wherever she is and it's her own business. And that's really, really exciting for your, gen, you know, for your generation that there are those possibilities that weren't so easy, I think, in the past but there's a lot of hardship and challenges that this time is, is giving us. And for, for you all as millennials and young people that it's, you know, I, I definitely feel you like that there's a lot of challenges. And I think when you talk about maturity, I think that, you know, you all are such leaders in not putting up just the courage and also not putting up with a lot of stuff where, you know, I came from the generation right after the civil rights movement. So, you know, people were like, well, we're just, we're just going to do our best and we're just going to show how you, how amazing we are. And then they're just going to understand and then it's all going to work out. And it's like, we've already seen that that doesn't actually solve it necessarily. And so you all are so, like the impatience that, that you have is actually really inspiring. And I, I mean, my encouragement is just to celebrate who you are and to, to celebrate your courage and your uniqueness and and the fact that you uplift other people around you. Um, I think that the idea of um, embracing difference, you all have that on a far greater level than, you know, my generation had, you know. So I think that's really beautiful. And um, just what we've seen with people going and, and actively supporting um, the Black Lives Matter movement, I think even though we had multicultural support, you know, during the times of the civil rights movement, I think now it's probably greater than it's ever been. So even though there's been all of these horrible things, there's a lot of things to be encouraged by and just to do self-care, you know, because I think that you all also are the generation of screens, of looking at screens like 10, 12, 14 hours a day or every waking moment from when you wake, wake up, you look at your phone and then you're on in class on Zoom for six hours and then you're doing your homework and reading books online and then you're watching Netflix and then you're doing Facebook and Instagram. And it's like, get out there and breathe and be in the trees and, and like really make sure you're intentionally living your life because that's where the vision's going to come from because the creativity is like central for us finding new ways out of this mess <laughs> so i know that wasn't specific musical advice necessarily but i think it applies to music and anything else you're trying to do Oh, thank you so much. No, that was perfect. Thank you so much. I think thank you. It's, it's, it's just been so inspirational for all of us. Um, I invite all of us to, I think it's, there's only two minutes left, so I think we'll call it a day. Um, uh, but I do want to invite everyone uh, who's in Zoom and all of us here to unmute our, our mics and uh, 
and to give a round of applause and a, a warm thank you to Nicole Mitchell for joining us today. Nicole, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you so much. Everyone thank you. All right. <laughs> Noise cancellation. <laughs> uh, yeah. Really. Standing, standing ovations. <laughs> Aw, really, I wish I could see y'all. Thank you so much, Nicole. And um, we'll be in touch. And I want to thank everyone for joining us um, and uh, encourage you all to, to listen to Nicole's music, to buy her music, uh, to watch and buy and support uh, Nicole and her, her career and all of us. So thank you so much. And we'll see you again soon. Okay. Okay. Take care. Yes, take care. Bye. Everyone. Bye. <laughs>